What I'm wanting to do today is I want to just think about the absolute basics of leadership and Christian leadership, the paradigms and purpose of leadership. Um, because I think although that, that is, um, in a sense, stuff that we already know, nothing I'm sure I'm going to say today will be new to you, I think it is absolutely foundational for us as Christian leaders. We need to keep in mind what it means to be a leader and particularly what it means to be a Christian um, uh, leader. Um, and I think one of the challenges is that sometimes when we're in leadership positions, we can easily lose sight of that and of the importance of those absolute foundational uh, principles. So that's what we're going to be thinking about. I want to think about what it means to be a leader and particularly uh, what it means to be um, a Christian uh, sort of uh, leader. I don't know how you defined um, leadership, um, but in my working definition of leadership, the way I think of leadership, is it seems to me that leadership is all about the exercise of authority over other people in order to achieve a collective objective. It's about the exercise of authority over other people in order to um, achieve a collective objective. And that seems to me to be summarized um, the essence of what leadership uh, is. It does involve the um, exercise of authority um, the leader, to some extent, has the right to be able to make decisions, to um, ask people to act in particular ways, to be able to um, enforce those decisions. Now, that authority might come from an office or a position that the um, leader holds. So um, I work as the national leader of a group of um, churches. Um, I've been elected to that position by the churches. And because of the position that I hold, I have a, 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 a large measure of authority over the organization and what the organization does and how the organization uses its resources. That authority goes together with responsibility for what the organization accomplishes. But my office to which I've been appointed carries authority with it. In my local church, I serve as an elder in my local church. Again, I'm elected and appointed to be an elder by the church, and that gives me a certain level of authority to exercise within the, the local church context. It comes from the position that I have, and as an elder, I have an authority and responsibility that church members don't have in the same way. So authority can come in, in that way. Um, it can also derive from a person's competence, it might be a result of their skills, their abilities, their gifts, um, that they exercise authority from um, uh, their competence. It might actually be a result of their personality. Charismatic individuals can exercise a high degree of authority because people um, look uh, to them. So it's the exercise of authority, particularly authority over other people, um, so whether uh, in the church or in an organization, um, uh, uh, and with that objective of accomplishing um, a common uh, or collective purpose. And I think that's um, generically true of leadership, that is lead true of leadership in the world. That's essentially what, for example, the coach of a sports team does. Coach of a sports team has authority um, over people um, in order to achieve the collective purpose of winning a game or ultimately win winning a league. That's effectively what a CEO of an organization um, sort of um, has and exercises. That's, for example, what a politician um, exercises. What's um, distinctive about Christian leadership is therefore bound up with the way authority is exercised and what it's exercised for. The distinctiveness of Christian leadership is bound up with the way that authority is used over people and what the collective goal is for which that authority is to be used. Um, and of course, um, uh, within um, the exercise of Christian leadership, um, uh, leaders are using their authority um, to achieve God's goals for his people. Um, and I think the best way of describing that is that God's purpose for his people is that we should make disciples. That's the great task that we've been given, um, which means uh, kind of in a sense reaching lost people with the good news of the gospel and growing people into the likeness of Christ. That's ultimately what we use our God-given authority for. And I hope that whatever your organization is, whatever its particular ministry is, um, its ultimate goal is in, in that sense the making of disciples. Um, there are a whole variety of things it might do, whether it's a local church, a relief agency, an education agency, but its ultimate purpose, the reason why it exists, is in some ways to seek to make 
disciples, serving um, God's uh, collective purpose, fulfilling his plan. So you might say the purpose of Christian leadership is to bring glory to Jesus by using God-given authority and power to make disciples who will submit to him as Lord and obey his teaching and enter into his kingdom. That's the goal of what um, our our leadership is um, all about. And as those who um, are leaders, um, our task is to serve uh, Jesus faithfully, um, to be um, essentially under shepherds of him who is um, the chief shepherd, which is a reminder to us that as um, leaders, we are also those who need to be led. Um, In Christian leadership, um, as leaders, we are also always people who need to be led. Jesus is the ultimate leader, and uh, we need to be um, led um, by him. How we go about most of our work, how we go about most of our um, exercise of authority, um, uh, well, the Bible tells us there are a range of things that we um, do um, in the consequence of our leading, the way that that authority is exercised. And it's uh, often a combination of encouraging, exhorting, teaching, training, rebuking, correcting, um, disciplining, so that a group of people can serve that collective goal. That seems to me to be the essence of what uh, kind of leadership is about and the essence of what um, Christian uh, leadership is about. Now, the reason why we're considering this kind of paradigm and um, purpose of leadership is because um, although there are obviously commonalities between leadership um, in the world and leadership, uh, Christian leadership, um, Christian leadership ought to be distinctive. It ought to be distinctive and it ought to be different. And it ought to be different both in terms of what the goal of um, leadership is and in the way that um, uh, leadership is exercised, the way that authority um, is used. And uh, I think the, um, uh, uh, the challenge for us is that we are all aware of situations in which those in positions of Christian leadership have misused their authority and misused their position and have in the end brought discredit Um, on the gospel. I'm sure that we're all aware of situations that maybe we know personally, perhaps even people that we've been close to, who have um, been exposed to be abusive leaders in some way or another, who have misused um, the sort of a God-given authority that they have, who have exploited that position, um, have oppressed other people, have harmed people, Um, uh, have been exposed for um, hypocrisy. And so the reason why we're wanting to look at this area and think about just these basics of Christian leadership is to warn ourselves of the dangers of leadership so that we might be guarded against becoming leaders who misuse the authority that we've been given. And I think that is crucially important for us. Um, And one of the challenges in leadership is actually the potential for abusing and misusing our position I think actually becomes greater the more senior we become in leadership. You might think leadership becomes easier the more senior you become, but actually I think the potentials for misusing authority and power and position actually become greater the more authority, power and position that you have. Um, uh, So um, we have to just come back to fundamentals if we're to avoid um, uh, behaving in these abusive Um, uh, oppressive ways. And I think in many of the cases in which um, uh, abusive leadership has occurred, the reality is that it's because those in leadership positions forgot those basics and neglected them. So as I said, nothing I'm going to say to you I think is new. It's all obvious. It's all things you know already. But I think they're things that are crucially important that we need to um, uh, constantly uh, keep in mind. So maybe there are a number of sort of um, well-known leadership scandals that have erupted that you have become um, aware of. Um, uh, Often they've involved leaders who've been very high profile, perhaps leaders who've been highly successful, leaders who have been looked up to, um, leaders who've been seen as models of leadership and have taught leadership to others, and yet their failings have been um, uh, exposed. You might think about someone like Bill Hybels at Willow Creek, Um, Again, leading a leadership conference of thousands of people uh, on an annual basis who um, ultimately was um, exposed of having harassed and mistreated women within um, the life of um, the church. 
or Ravi Zacharias, an international kind of evangelist, um, hugely respected and used, um, author of numerous books, but yet who was exposed to have a, a secret life um, of sexual abuse, um, financial kind of impropriety within um, his uh, organization. Um, uh, someone like Mark Driscoll, who was pastor of um, uh, kind of Mars Hill Church. Some of you may well have listened to the series of podcasts that reflected on the rise and the imploding of the ministry at Mars Hill. Again, not physical or sexual abuse, but really a kind of a misuse of power and a, a sort of an arrogance around power that developed um, in um, his uh, uh, kind of leadership, uh, which caused many people to become uh, kind of harmed um, as the organization effectively became a brand promoting um, him as a uh, kind of leader. Or in some similar ways, James McDonald at Harvest Bible Church in um, uh, kind of Chicago, similarly a leader who became immensely powerful um, and apparently arrogant in the use of um, power um, within the church. More recently, um, within the Hillsong movement, kind of uh, sort of Bill Huster, Bill Houston has been the kind of leader of, uh, Brian Houston has been the leader of Hillsong, um, again, um, stepping down as a result of the exposure of problems with alcohol and also impropriety um, with uh, a kind of a woman on the kind of um, on a conference. Now, I, I'm not, I'm raising those not because I take any delight in speaking about them, but they are just the reality of high profile leaders whose um, uh, sort of leadership has been exposed to be flawed and abusive. Um, uh, in my own context, in my own country, there have been a number of high-profile um, leadership scandals that have rocked us um, uh, within conservative evangelicalism. And I think they've been particularly shocking because we've been familiar with appalling leadership abuses, for example, in the Roman Catholic Church and child sex abuse. And I think sometimes we've arrogantly assumed it's not a problem for us because we're Bible people. And then things have been um, exposed that have taken place. Um, they won't be names that um, you necessarily know, but John Smythe was a, a leader on camps for 14 to 18 year olds who kind of um, was a very charismatic teacher and individual, very successful lawyer. Um, he built relationships with these individuals and sort of invited boys to be discipled by them and then sort of viciously physically abused them um, in um, that uh, kind of process. Um, Jonathan Fletcher was a, a significant leader within evangelicalism. Um, uh, again, um, uh, sort of a very high profile figure, respected teacher, long sort of ministry um, in a, a, a church. Um, but it emerged that um, he had sort of basically bullied and humiliated staff over a long period of time. Um, and then with some people had kind of got involved in kind of naked massages and in a discipleship group, again, sort of an element of mutual beating that was taking place in those groups in the name of Christian discipleship. And again, that's just exposed um, a, a sort of a real flaw uh, in leadership. Steve Timmis, who was a leader in a church and became national leader of um, Acts 29, again, was removed over allegations that were made of exercising bullying in relation to staff. And then a whole series of allegations emerged from within his kind of church context as to how people felt they'd been bullied and mistreated um, by his uh, kind of leadership. So there's a spectrum of kind of situations of high profile leaders who have been um, exposed in some cases to have been living a secret and hidden life, um, in some cases to have physically or sexually abused people, in other cases to have misused their power. And I think at the heart of all of those kind of leadership scandals, that the heart of how that leadership has gone wrong is that in the end leadership became self-serving rather than other serving. It seems to be at the very heart of how leadership goes wrong. The authority and power and position that a person enjoyed was ultimately used for their own benefit. It brought opportunities to be able to exploit and abuse others or to enjoy power and status over others. And um, uh, that led to failings um, in leadership. And I think it's crucial to recognize that in many of these cases, it wasn't that the whole of the person's leadership was characterized in that way. Many aspects of their leadership were continue to be successful, continue to appear to be faithful, but there were elements that were um, exposed. And that's the reality. Um, and I guess you could tell, as I said, your own stories of people who would not be as high profile, but maybe have fallen in similar ways. So that's why it's so important that we think about 
what leadership is meant to be like so that we don't fall into those same um, uh, kind of failings. And most of you are at, at an earlier stage of leadership. Um, and I think it's just at, at the very beginning laying foundations that are, are guarding against the potential for the development of that kind of misuse of leadership um, in um, the future. And as I said, it's, it's, it's often the neglecting of basics that causes that to happen. So what should Christian leadership be like? What are the um, fundamentals for Christian leadership for avoiding a kind of a misuse of authority and, and power in this way? And of course here, um, it is Jesus himself who's the paradigm example for it. Um, Jesus um, is the, um, uh, the model, the example of uh, leadership for us, and he teaches us um, how we should lead. And what is to be distinctive about Christian leadership is the Christian leader is to be a servant. That's what um, Jesus teaches. The pattern for Christian leadership is a servant um, leadership. And what in essence that means is that um, uh, it's the use of authority um, to serve the best good of others. That's the essence of what leadership, servant leadership is all about. Servant leadership is not denying that the leader has authority. Servant leadership is not um, saying that the leader is obliged to do what people want, that that's what serving um, means. It's rather the use of the authority of leadership for the best good of others. In other words, the authority is to be used for the benefit of others, not for the benefit of the leader, is the way that um, the New Testament speaks about it. So it's, it's a leading that is serving and accomplishing the purposes of God, not self-serving um, and benefiting um, uh, the leader. Um, now, the, the best good of other people isn't necessarily what they would want. Um, the best good of others is to enable them to fulfill God's purposes for themselves. So for them to be able to grow in Christ-likeness and to serve in God's mission. So um, uh, it's important that we see that the goal of servant leadership isn't simply doing what people want. It is about doing what is best for uh, people um, and seeking their, their best good. Well, this is the pattern that Jesus um, teaches and um, models. So we'll spend a little bit of time thinking of um, uh, sort of Jesus teaching um, in uh, this area. So Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to um, uh, 45, Jesus um, lays down the way in which the leadership of his disciples is to be um, distinctive and different from uh, the leadership of um, the world. This is um, a, a sort of a passage in which um, you probably know the story. Um, uh, James and John, who are Jesus' disciples, basically come to him um, and they say to him, uh, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That's striking in itself. What do you want? Well, they say, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other in your left in glory. So they basically come to Jesus saying, please give us the top jobs and the top positions in your kingdom. We want to be the top leaders um, alongside you. Now, they're not asking for that, basically because they see themselves as the people who are going to be most able to serve Jesus' kingdom and lead it well. They're asking for those top jobs because they think they're the positions of highest status and they want all the privileges and benefits that go with those jobs. That's what they're looking for. The, the leadership they want is for their own benefit and their own um, status. And so Jesus um, uh, sort of rebukes them. He actually tells them they don't understand what leadership um, is at all. They've completely misunderstood uh, the way that leadership works in uh, God's uh, kingdom. Um, and he contrasts the, the way of the Gentiles, a leadership um, uh, amongst um, uh, unbelievers, um, where um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over their subjects. In other words, they're not servants. The uh, people exist for their benefit. The leader is the one who gets all the benefit out of the leading. They lord it over them and exercise authority over them. He says, not to be like that amongst you. Um, instead, the way to greatness is to be a servant. The way to greatness is to be a slave of uh, kind of all. So leadership is not about what you get out of it. 
It's not about having a whole load of people serve you. It's instead about serving others. And um, that's not just what Jesus teaches, that's what Jesus models. So um, uh, he says to them, not, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's what Jesus is going to do through his death on the cross. So actually Jesus says he's the one with supreme authority. He uses the title Son of Man. You probably know the title Son of Man comes from the book of Daniel. And the Son of Man is the glorious heavenly king. He's the one to whom all authority is given. And here's the astonishing thing. The one who has all of that authority gives his life as a ransom for others who need to be rescued. That's the nature of the leadership of Jesus. He doesn't lord it over his disciples. Instead, he gives himself as a ransom um, for them. So that's, that's the pattern of how leadership is to be exercised, how authority is to be used. Um, and then supremely, that is picked up particularly in Philippians chapter 2, where Paul talks about the paradigm for um, the way that status, authority, um, is to be used within the Christian community. Now, um, in Philippians, it's not specifically about leadership. It's about the, the way that Christians relate to one another. But what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 lays the foundations and the pattern for leadership and how it's to be exercised. And Philippians chapter 2, um, uh, sort of uh, Paul presents to the Philippians the example of Jesus, who is the one who was um, uh, kind of equal with God, Yet Paul says, um, was uh, sort of willing to set that aside in order to become a servant and become obedient to death, even death on a cross. So the one who had the highest place, in a sense, was willing to um, use his authority and his position to become the servant um, of uh, sort of those who were lost, to die on the cross so that they could be rescued. So again, that is the paradigm of how um, uh, sort of Christian leadership is to serve. And, uh, and, and Paul sets that before the Philippians as um, the model for how we're to relate to one another. So within the Philippian church, he says that that's the example that you're to follow. Um, you're to uh, reflect humility and be humble just as Christ was humble. And humility in that context means effectively being willing to serve one another. In the context of Philippians, to be humble means to be willing to count others as better than yourselves. What counting others as better than yourselves means, it doesn't mean pretending that they can do everything better than you can. It means rather that you are to see everybody else as someone you've got a duty to serve. You're never to think that you are superior and therefore you don't have a duty to serve them, but they should serve you. And that's one of the great problems of leadership. As we become more senior, as we gain position, as we gain status, we can fall into thinking other people ought to be serving us. After all, I'm the leader. Whereas in actual fact, um, uh, what Paul says is um, you're instead to use your leadership to serve others. That's what humility um, looks like. So humility doesn't mean the leader doesn't have authority. Humility means that the um, leader uses that authority to um, serve uh, others. So that's the, the, the fundamental pattern of Christian leadership. Um, leadership authority is not misused to be self-serving, sort of oppressing, exploiting, abusing others. It's to be used in service of others. And as leaders, we're called to be those who are giving ourselves um, in the service of others, just as Jesus did. And that will be incredibly costly um, for us uh, to do that. So leadership is not a, a kind of a privileged position to enjoy. It's a responsibility to be um, exercised um, in the service of um, others. And I think that's the key thing that those in Christian leadership need to keep in mind so that they live according to that pattern um, of uh, Jesus. Let me very briefly, because we've got time, talk about how then do you guard yourself against becoming an abusive leader? What are the ways that we can make sure that we are the Christ-like servant leaders that we need to be? And a few things that are just absolutely vital that we do. We do. Firstly, we've got to guard our own hearts. 
as leaders, we have to take responsibility for guarding our own hearts. Um, we need to make sure that we ourselves are walking closely with the Lord. Um, our own personal devotional life and following of Jesus is key. And in many cases, abusive leadership occurs because leaders are no longer guarding their own personal devotional life with the Lord. Reading the Bible, praying, being part of a church community, sitting under other people's teaching rather than always being the teacher are absolutely key. So all of that is about being a disciple or a sheep who follows Jesus. You never cease being a disciple. You never cease being a sheep. Taking up our cross daily, which is the heart of the Christian life. Um, the pattern of servant leadership is the pattern of the cross. Jesus says we are to crucify self on a daily basis. Um, uh, actually, the, uh, the way to avoid becoming a self-serving leader is to daily be crucifying ourselves. Basic Christian discipline. Um, fighting the temptations um, uh, of the flesh. So the Christian life is a battle against the desires of the flesh. We need to put them to death in the power of the spirit. And for leaders, um, it's those basic temptations of sex, money, and power are often the ones that we have to fight. Um, and I think for leaders, the temptation of power and misusing power is one that we need to keep um, fighting. And then lastly, seeking accountability to others. So to make sure that we are um, accountable. Um, I think actually in some cases that's, that's the exercise of power plurally. I think most power in the Bible is exercised plurally, not just by individuals. Churches are led by groups of elders, not just a single person. So plural leadership is a kind of accountability. Sometimes leaders hate plural leadership because it means that they have to move more slowly and win others over, but it is, it is the better way of making sure that power is not misused. And then virtually every structure has some kind of accountability built into it. In a church, that may be to a denomination, it may be to a congregation, but um, most organizations will have an authority structure. It might be a board that holds a CEO and the staff accountable. As a leader, do not fight against the accountability structure, but instead make sure there is one and make sure that it works well. It protects you and it protects the organization. And the challenge is when leaders basically subvert the accountability structure. And the problem is that powerful manipulative leaders can basically avoid accountability. Um, instead, make sure you embrace accountability so that you don't fall into becoming that kind of leader. I hope those are some helpful thoughts for how you can guard yourself. Let me just pray and then we'll finish. Father, we want to thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus. We want to thank you and praise you that he is the perfect leader and the example to us. Thank you that he does not lord it over us, but instead he gave himself as a ransom for us. He went to the cross. And thank you that that's the pattern of leadership that he sets for us. And whatever leadership you've given us in whatever context, might we lead like the Lord Jesus. Guard and protect as we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.